Turner Commercial, scene 1A, take one, marker. Good evening, America. In the coming election, you have an extremely important decision to make. With your vote, you may choose to continue to overextend our military presence throughout the world, or choose to utilize American resources to fix problems here in America. If elected your president, I will withdraw all military presence from all foreign soil. I will then redirect 50% of our $420 billion annual military budget to fix health care, social security, education, and homeland defense. I think you'll agree that our extremely aggressive behavior has seriously eroded our ability to work in the world community as an equal member of the world community. America can no longer be the world's self-appointed policeman. If you elect me, I will take the savings from our defense budget. I will create new jobs. I will fund research for new energy development. And I will stop the dependency on foreign oil and lay the foundation for a better, stronger America. The world population is growing rapidly, but the U.S. population and GDP are shrinking in relation to the rest of the world. We simply can no longer sustain our current military presence. Something has to be done. Our greatest resource isn't our money. It is the lives of the men and women of the American Armed Forces. How many more American lives must be lost because of our interference in the internal affairs of other countries? Vote for me, and I will bring our servicemen and women home, home to a better, stronger America, an America that will again be respected. So what if we did? What if America withdrew its military presence from around the world? The U.S. military budget of $420 billion is six times larger than the Russian budget, and they are still the second largest spender and is 30 times larger than all the U.S. potential enemies, Cuba, Iran, Libya, North Korea, Sudan, and Syria, combined. Now, even when you add China and Russia to this list, these eight countries together spend only about 30% of the U.S. military budget. How much can we spend, and for how long? The world is growing by about a billion people every decade, and most of our traditional allies are washing their hands of us. So if the next presidential candidate were to advocate a complete withdrawal from all foreign countries, would you vote for him? If you said yes, you would probably not be alone. As a matter of fact, many Americans would like to see more money spent on domestic issues or simply not spend and return to the taxpayers than on military interventions. But would this be the right thing to do? And what about the other countries? What would happen to them? What would the world be like without us? I think I was about nine years old when my obsession with America started. The Making of a Nation, a program by the Voice of America. I was actually using the same radio that my grandfather used 20 years before to find out that the Allies landed in Normandy and later on the Germany surrendered. His joy didn't last long. By 1947, the new communist government arrested him. The family land and the farmhouse have been nationalized, and my grandparents have been deported hundreds of miles away in a labor camp. 
My childhood was filled with stories of Mr. Truman and Mr. Eisenhower. They were supposed to come back and free Eastern Europe from the Russians. It never happened. My grandparents had one daughter. She was about 14 when she dropped high school and had to join them in the camp. Ten years later, a young man knocked at the door of my grandparents. He was also detained. Just released from prison for being against the Soviet occupation. He was sent to the camp but had no place to sleep. My grandparents took pity on him. This is the story of my parents. I can't really tell you when in my childhood I realized all I wanted to be was a free man. And I really wanted to come to America. As a teenager I was covering the subtitles of American movies with a piece of paper to force myself to understand English. I was 20 years old the first time I ran across the border to Yugoslavia. I didn't get far. The Yugoslavs caught me and brought me back. I was sentenced to a few months in prison. I knew what happened to others. There were pictures like this on display at the police stations at times. I just didn't care, I just couldn't live there anymore. After I got out of prison, I ran again and again. Two years later, I made it to Yugoslavia, and then I hid in a cargo train that took me across the border to Austria. It was the happiest day of my life. A year after that, I received political asylum from the U.S. Embassy in Vienna and finally met my childhood dream. Now I wonder if my family was right to wait for an American liberation. Today, it seems that many nations can hardly wait for the Americans to leave. Is the world a better place or worse because of us? And more than that, what would happen should America leave the world alone and become again just a normal nation? A republic, not an empire. To find an answer to these questions, I decided to travel on three continents and speak with people from many countries. In a way, this is the story of how the world sees us. Every time, somewhere in the world, something goes wrong, the Americans have their finger in there. We have got the feeling that they only want, want to improve their economy. How the US acts is not the right way. Most of the time it's too late, it's too brutal. Somehow it's respectless, really respectless. If the United States were to draw all their military from the rest of the world, there would be a global celebration. When you hear people, particularly in Europe, condemning the United States as if it were an evil empire, you can't help but smile because it's not that long ago that there really was an evil empire menacing Western Europe. I mean, we were the savior of, of Europe. We stood up against the Soviet Union. It doesn't cause them any philosophical pain whatsoever to take your protection and badmouth you. Yes, Americans saved Europe, absolutely. And the French are very th grateful for that. But it's been 60 years. That's right. In fact, a lot has changed even since I left in the 80s. 
There is no more Iron Curtain and the old enemies of World War II have formed a union. Militarism gave way to social programs and my fellow Europeans have learned to employ diplomacy, not war. At this time, the European Union is the only entity on earth that surpasses the United States as an economic power. So I wonder, should the US step down? Could the United Europe be the next superpower or at least a regional power? Would their methods be better? Would they do a better job? During the early 90s, the country of Yugoslavia was falling apart. Over 2 million people were forced to relocate, and 250,000 people lost their life in the biggest genocide since World War II. Again, each side is charging the other with atrocities. The facts are unclear, but some terrible things were done in the final hours. Bosnia was one of the six provinces that once made the country of Yugoslavia. By 1991, two of these provinces, Slovenia and Croatia, broke off to become independent countries. Shortly thereafter, Bosnia also wanted to become independent. But unlike Croatia and Slovenia, Bosnia was ethnically mixed between Orthodox Serbs, Muslim Bosnians and some Croats. This created a problem. While most Muslim Bosnians wanted independence, the Serbs wanted to remain part of Yugoslavia, sparking a civil war that lasted for four years. Walking the streets of Sarajevo, the bombed out buildings remind you at every step of the atrocities committed here. But as the slaughter dragged on for four long years, what were my fellow Europeans doing? For the first year of the war, next to nothing was done. While the US was busy with Iraq during the first Gulf War, the European governments simply could not decide on a course of action. By 1992, the French, English, and Dutch sent peacekeeping troops under the United Nations command. Hello. 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 The only problem was that they were not allowed to shoot at anyone or protect civilians. Report after report of atrocities was filed and sent to their parliaments, but nothing could bring the European leaders to take real military action. Instead, they believed in diplomacy meetings after meetings, talks, negotiations, and more meetings and talks. It was bottoms up for the Germans, who were savoring the latest brew. The largest European nation didn't send any troops at all. Branded with the Nazi stigma from too much intervention in World War II, now they couldn't bring themselves to take any action. And as for the Americans, for once, we were not doing anything either. After protecting Western Europe from the Soviets for the last 40 years, maybe it was time to let Europe take the lead in Bosnia. After all, they weren't fighting Hitler or Stalin, but stopping a civil war in a small country. By 1995, the atrocities were getting worse and worse. In the summer of that year, the Serbs mobilized hundreds of soldiers in order to round up and kill the Bosnian civilians in the small town of Srebrenica. Hours before the Serbs arrived, the men tried to escape into the woods, while the women and children stayed behind. Among them, Efendic Fadila 
whose son decided to flee. On me je poljubio i dok me je ljubio drftala mu brada i govorio mi ne ne mama nemoj se brinuti za meni ne ne mama nemoj da plačiš ako se meni nešto desi. To su bile posljednje riječi mog sina a to je bilo 11. jula utorak dva sata popudni kad sam ušla u kamp. The camp was a battery factory in Srebrenica. It was also the headquarters of the Dutch soldiers and the peacekeepers. The Bosnian refugees thought they were running to a place of safety, but little did they know that the Serbs were ordering the Dutch soldiers to stand down. Some Serbian soldiers even wore Dutch uniforms, tricking the Bosnians into a false sense of security. Čuli su se te noći užasni krikovi. Bila je mukla tišina i na jedan put užasni krikovi i sve se digne na noge. A šta se dešava? Dolazili su holandski vojnici i vojnici četnici koji su bili obučeni u uniformi holandskih vojnika. Narod su da samo sjedi, da sjedi, da ne bude na nogama. The battery factory went from being a place of refuge to becoming a death chamber. While the Dutch peacekeeping troops looked on, the Serbs murdered 8,000 Bosnians. Among the dead were Fadila's husband and son, both of whom were buried in a mass grave across the street. Their remains have yet to be identified. Clinton is a good guy, but I am a good guy. For the time of his mandate, my child was not killed. He was killed, of course. He was killed. I didn't find his head in his head. She was not identified in the coffin. But they were just two of the 8,000 killed at Srebrenica, all while the European peacekeeping forces stood by, paralyzed by the indecision of their governments. The European people, the European governments, really waited a little bit too long. And I think if the uh, Americans wouldn't have come, the killing would have, you know, go on, go on and on. The expectation of the people of Bosnia and Croatia was that someone strong will come and save them. I svi smo gledali uprli oči u tu Ameriku. Šta Amerika odluči to će biti. Ja puno vjerovala nisam ni Americi ni Evropi. They were begging the French, they were begging the Europeans to go in and help them out. And I think in that case, yes, we definitely should have gone in. We should have gone in sooner. I'm glad we did go in, and I think we should have done more. So the United States intervened through a series of bombing raids, peace negotiations, and under the supervision of thousands of American troops, peace was restored in Boston. In Dayton, in the United States, three presidents signed up to a peace agreement. That peace agreement was devised to give you a chance to live a life free of fear, to be able to grow up in a country where its citizens have the choice to do as they wish. One of the lessons of 20th century history is that ethnically mixed societies can explode. The Balkans is a synonym for non-stability, <laughs> and it has been that forever, and it will, I think, remain for quite a long time still. Europe, in fact, has a tendency to keep ethnic minorities as ethnic minorities, and it's no longer a problem that's just confined to the Balkans. In many ways, it's a general European problem that's getting more serious as more and more Muslims immigrate uh, into the European Union 
and find themselves living in what are effectively ghettos. It seems to me that Bosnia may not just be a remnant of Europe's past, it may conceivably foreshadow a future for the whole of Europe, a future of ethnic and even religious conflict that I find frankly terrifying. The civil war in Bosnia, just 300 miles from my hometown, convinced me at the time that the European powers could not handle a conflict in their own backyard. But what if it were to happen again? Actually, it did. In 1999, the Kosovars sought independence from Serbia after their civil rights were taken by Slobodan Milosevic. This move again triggered an ethnic cleansing on a massive scale. This time, United States did not wait for a European response. Neither did any European power want to take charge of the Kosovo situation. The US gave the Serb leaders several ultimatums. Then the NATO forces systematically bombed Serbia for over two months, taking out bridges, power plants and factories until the Serbs withdrew their forces from Kosovo. When NATO began to wage war against what was left of Yugoslavia, I was aghast because it seemed to me, for all kinds of reasons, to be a radical departure from the entire post-war order based on the United Nations Charter because this was an intervention in the internal affairs of a sovereign state. Kosovo was a province. If I could choose, you know, I, I probably w w would choose that no one intervene in Serbia, probably. I think that we must solve our own problem. That's, that, that, that's natural. Well, you need mediators in some kind of conflicts. When people cannot agree on something, there is, ne there is a, necessi a necessity for a mediator. But does this mediator has to have arms or impose? This is not a mediator. We are in Kosovo for the same reason you were here. Some things are worth fighting for. A future not dominated by massive killing of innocent civilians because of the ethnic or racial heritage they were born with or the way they worship God. Military intervention by the United States was most probably an attempt not to repeat the same mistakes and go into the long, like three and a half, four years, war on the territory of Kosovo, but to stop it in time. I and those who were critical of President Clinton and indeed of Prime Minister Blair were actually wrong. This was the right thing to do. Uh, the imperialism of human rights is uh, in many ways the most desirable kind of imperialism. So what would have happened if the United States did not intervene in Bosnia and what did the European nations learn from this war? Is there a future for the United Europe as a superpower? I think that uh, today, the uh, last two Bosnians would try to find each other within the territory of the country, trying to kill each other. And in, in Brussels, in Paris, London, Moscow, they were still arguing about, yeah, but I'm not quite sure how, how is the way to approach the problem and things like that. Europa is not possible to solve the problem without America. That's how she learned. To je kroz čitavu istoriju. Prvi svjetski rat da, da kad se Amerika uključila zaustavljena. Drugi svjetski rat kad se uključila Amerika zaustavljena. If the Bosnian wars were to begin again or if Kosovo uh, were to blow up again, I think there is next to nothing that the European Union could credibly do to stop it. Nothing has really changed in the past 10 years. Europe is still a military pygmy. Uh, in Europe you're dealing with a generation of Europeans who have been become used to U.S. military forces as being the backbone for their defense. And they have allowed military spending and the development of military forces and the willingness to serve in the military to really seriously deteriorate. Europe is, is very afraid of, of a next war, a next big war, you know, because Europe has been involved in, in two big wars and you know, it was, it was all a mess in Europe. I think um, especially the Germans are afraid of what could happen. If, you know, if we interfere, in, they might fight back. And what happens then? 
I think there is an enormous resistance to the idea of a collective European defence capability, most particularly in Britain. And even the French and Germans, who've gone the furthest down this route, have so far done nothing other than produce a kind of token force. It isn't actually capable of any serious military activity. Part of the problem is that the European Union is not the United States of Europe. It's an economic union which pulls in quite a limited way the sovereignty of some very strong nation states with a very great deal of history behind them. The European countries are very different. Europe is not a melting pot. They're just a bunch of, like a bunch of squabbling brothers and sisters. And it's hard to get them to, to agree on something. And then it's hard to get them to decide, all right, now who is going to be the leader of all this? My worry is that you could have the United States withdrawing into isolation and nobody stepping into the breach. And then the whole world could end up being like the Balkans in the 1990s. The issue of humanitarian intervention is really a, a late 20th century phenomenon. It comes after the end of the Cold War. Uh, prior to the end of the Cold War, any sort of any United States action throughout the world would have risked a, 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 an escalation into war or some sort of conflict with the Soviet Union. Once the Soviet Union goes away, in the United States is this unipolar military power they have not only the ability to intervene militarily, and some people will say they have the responsibility to intervene. America is a good thing to do with the United States. It means that if this is a strong weapon, it means that it is not a good thing to do. It is not a good thing to do with the United States and the United States and the United States and the United States. Americans always sort of give part of a possible solution of a problem to Europeans, but they are not quite able to get together. They cannot find a common statement, they cannot find a common policy, and that's why the United States is sort of invited to come and to say, okay, I mean, we saw you cannot solve the problem. That's why we have to do it. We see when a country becomes threatening, totalitarian, brutal, that we've got to think about doing something about it that our passiveness in the face of Pol Pot of Cambodia led to perhaps two million deaths out of eight million people. Our passiveness in Rwanda probably led to the death of 800,000 people. Had we intervened in some way, you might have reduced those numbers. We didn't. We didn't. We invade sovereign nations, we topple governments, we manipulate economies because they don't serve our needs. And because we are the one and only military superpower, who is going to challenge us? At the present time, the U.S. has military bases in over 90 countries, including Tajikistan and uh, oh, uh, Djibouti. I wonder how many fuel cell factories we could build here in America with the money we spend to maintain those remote bases. And even with half of our current military budget, we are still the strongest nation on Earth. I tell my critics we are not running away with simply being realistic about our needs. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. Where freedom takes hold, hatred gives way to hope. When freedom takes hold, men and women turn to the peaceful pursuit of a better life. American values and American interests lead in the same direction. We stand for human liberty.
the United States is the superpower of the world today because the United States cares. We're not only interested in our, in our own national concerns and in protecting our own national interests, we care ethically and morally. We, we care about democracy, we care about freedom. Well, promoting democracy might be true for Iraq. It meant a lot to me to see the Iraqi people voting for the first time in their history. But the region is still rife with kings, emirs, sultans and sheikhs who regard their countries as their personal property, and we supported many of them. How many of these guys were actually democratically elected? It's a more or less like a hypocrisy. They don't care much about democracy or uh, liberty or what people are doing and, and so on. They worry about, is, is there an interest in this region or not? Um, uh, what would I get from this? If it's in our interest, the companies, the oil companies and so on, we'll do it. So if we are in the Middle East for oil, there would be nothing new about that. Throughout history, all empires have gone where the resources are. And I should know that well. In 1940, Hitler took over Romania for its oil and grain, and after the war, the oil was taken again by the Soviet Union as a war reparation. In the meantime, millions of Romanians were living in dire misery. I guess the same thing happens in our time. Oil is still the most desired resource, and the United States is the largest consumer. So I went to one of the most oil-rich countries in the world, a country that just like Romania 60 years ago was invaded for its resource. In 1990, Saddam Hussein took over this small country. In Kuwait here, we never thought we had an enemy because we're always a peace-loving people. The reason Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait was oil. If Kuwait was an agricultural country, he wouldn't come near us. To him, it was simple greed. And we thought as Kuwaitis that once Saddam did the invasion, that all the other countries will start to come to our rescue. And this was the sad awakening. They didn't. As a matter of fact, some of them took sides with Saddam. The alternative was to go to a superpower. The United States was the alternative. So the United States intervened and in a matter of months drove the Iraqi forces out of Kuwait. Today, Kuwait has almost no military of their own and thousands of American troops on their soil. But does that mean that their oil is plundered? You know we're riding in time Got a own miracle mile We'll live just like a millionaire Just buy those houses and cars We're we'll acting like movie stars Just let these good times roll So education became free School, as you said, up to university Even up to doctorate degree There's no taxes and every Kuwaiti family is entitled to apply for either a piece of land or a house. I was amazed to find out that many Kuwaitis live better than many Americans. And that is because they actually get paid for the oil they sell. When the price of oil goes up, the American people, the taxpayers that fund the defense of Kuwait, pays more just like everybody else. I wonder how many empires throughout history ever paid for the resources they got. It's not a matter of oil. Americans did not come here just for oil. They can get oil, you know, cheaply from uh, Saddam Hussein. He offered them to sell, you know, a barrel of oil for less than $10. So it is not a matter only of oil when the American came here to liberate us from Saddam Hussein. So if we didn't come here just to take the oil, why did we come at all? To find out, I needed to learn more about the Arab world. 
After all, Kuwaitis are only one million out of the half a billion Arab people. So next I went to the most populous Arab country, and one that has no oil to sell. Welcome to Egypt. Egypt might be famous for their pyramids and monuments, but I found it to be a troubled country. The population of this country has doubled in only 30 years and just 5% of its land is usable. While there is some oil, it barely covers this country's own demand. And unlike Kuwait, there is no free housing or education from the government. Sad but true, this is the state of most of the Arab world the ones that haven't been blessed with all revenues. While most of the Middle Eastern countries share the same language, culture and religion, the differences in the standard of living are tremendous and mostly based on the size of the population and oil revenues. So is this the reason for all the wars and violence in this region? Well, I have argued that the problem in the Middle East isn't a clash of civilizations. It's a civilization of clashes uh, in the sense that there is a culture there uh, of political violence uh, that is deeply inimical to the emergence of uh, civil society and democracy of the sort that we know uh, in the West. So you have the Islamists of various kinds on, one, uh, on the one level. On the other uh, side, you have the dictatorships, the authoritarian dictatorships. And there hasn't been enough of an opportunity for the development of a, of, of a moderate middle. Especially after the invasion of, of Saddam and so on, uh, people worry about uh, what our neighbor is going to do uh, in the future. Before, maybe you could live within the boundaries of your wall, you build it high enough, you lock the door, you're safe. But when people start to learn how to jump into, inside your house or blow the wall to come inside, then it becomes a different deal. And you cannot live in seclusion anymore. Everybody is uh, under threat of some sort or the other from his neighbor. We know we are a defenseless nation, we're a peaceful nation, we're a small nation, in a bad neighborhood, in gigantic bad neighborhood. Iran, unfortunately, at this time, uh, is, is a danger, you know, why does Iran want to have nuclear power? Why does Iran want to go against the rest of the world when it comes to its nuclear program? Could the world be wrong and Iran is right? In order to be fair, in order to please the people of this region, you have to tell the Israelis probably to, to, to leave the, uh, at least part of the region that they uh, occupied. Uh, look at the wall, for instance, that the Israelis are building now and, and kicking some people out of their land. What are the Americans doing? The only occupation in the world now, anywhere in the world, the only occupied land is the Palestinian land, and that's not fair. And America has to do something about it. I realize how dear Israel is to the, you know, an American's heart and how the whole culture evolves when it comes to foreign policy to protecting Israel, but you cannot just run the world the way you like it to be. And as a friend of America, I think that it's time for America to address such a, a, a coral issue. Okay, the Middle East is a powder keg, but None of these countries pose a threat to us, and we also have to pay for the oil we get anyway. So I still don't know, why are we here? Let's get a European perspective. Oil is the point why the Americans start the war in Iraq. And it is the oil that, uh, are pe that people are get killed for over there. We know that oil is a real problem for us. We have to stay at peace with countries who, are in China, who have oil uh, resources. You can't put your sons into and your kids into war for oil. You should, uh, you sh I mean, you should use your head and, um, for example, make solar energies and all that stuff working. While the Europeans believe that we are in the Middle East to get the oil, if you look at the distribution, 
you would find out that the US is not the prime consumer of the Middle Eastern oil. Actually, most of the oil goes to China, Japan and the European Union that has almost no production of their own. Europeans have a long history of hypocrisy when it comes to the Middle East. The Europeans need stability in the Middle East. They're as dependent, indeed more dependent, on Middle Eastern oil than the United States. But they don't want, uh, at least uh, they don't all want, to pay the quite heavy price of trying to stabilize that region. So when Europeans bleat about American policy in the Middle East, you need to take it with a large grain of salt. And frankly, they don't see a threat to Middle East oil resources. The Europeans, I think, uh, would like to do work in the Middle East as a business proposition. They're not considering uh, the democratizing of regimes uh, throughout the Middle East, as the United States is doing. Uh, they'd much rather try to hold the lid on and, uh, and just see the Middle East as a source of oil, I think. Okay, but how about Asia? Japan, the second largest economy in the world, is also the largest consumer of Middle Eastern oil. What is their involvement in the region? Soon after the Second World War, Japanese emperor went to Japanese diet, which is a Japanese parliament, and gave a speech that from now on, Japan must be a pacifist country, heiwa kokka, or peace-oriented country. And Japanese public learned that they shouldn't opt for war, but peace. But what about China? They're actually the second largest consumer of oil in the world. China is in the midst of a really vast transformation in its dependence on oil. 20 or so years ago, China was an oil exporter. Uh, within the next 20 years, they're going to be a massive oil importer. China is going to be very sensitive to where their oil comes from and how assured that supply is going to be. It looks like they cannot do but rely overwhelmingly in the Middle East. To get Middle East oil, they need to be assured that the sea lines of communication with the Middle East are open. Right now, the sea lines of communication are open because of U.S. naval power. We don't think that it's fair for us to just, you know, keep the oil flow going, and the rest of the world is just sitting idle and buying oil and not doing anything about keeping the stability and the peace in this region. Therefore, we think that it is, it is a must for America and the rest of the world to really interfere in this region to keep the stability and peace so as the oil could keep on flowing. So if the United States is not the main beneficiary of the Middle Eastern oil, does it make sense for us to pay alone the price of involvement? Let me uh, say that what the United States is doing like an antibiotic. You cannot live on antibiotic for, for life or for good. You have to let these societies settle down, solve their differences and so on. You cannot keep this external factor uh, for, 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 for good. Uh, for instance, if a society like the Iraqi society now, we're saying that the moment the, the Americans would withdraw, maybe things would look worse. Maybe things would be worse for some time. But then the, the leaders of the Iraqi society or community would sit down and say, enough is enough, like what happened in Lebanon, for instance. You cannot go on with, with civil war for good. You cannot uh, stay there and say, we are, we are there to protect the world. Because you are there, you are, you are uh, spending money, you are, uh, your own soldiers or, or, or children are, are, are dying every day, and people are not very happy with you. It doesn't make sense. What would happen should the United States leave the region to its own devices? Take away the United States, and there's really no way of knowing what's going to happen. If there were no American commitment to the Middle East, uh, if there had never been an American commitment to the Middle East, there would be no State of Israel. I think that's the first and most obvious point. It's very, very hard to imagine such a small state with so few assets surviving without American support. So you'd have to say goodbye to that. Israel 
از صحنه روزگار حذف نشود این فریاد ها به قوت خود باقی Sooner or later, Israel's enemies, including the current regime in Iran, would be able to wage a war against it that the Israelis would only be able to win at a colossally high price. So that's number one. Number two is what would the various states in that region do to one another, absent the United States? We know that Saddam was capable of waging war against two of his neighbors, uh, because he not only invaded Kuwait, but before that he went to war against Iran. We know that Lebanon was ripped apart by its neighbors and turned into a puppet state uh, by Syria. The list goes on and on. And if you take away the United States from this story, it seems to me you don't just have the destruction of Israel, but you then have the self-destruction uh, of the Arab world. It's a very, very volatile part of the world. And it seems to me that those who blame the problems of the Middle East on the United States or on the colonizers before the United States are completely missing the point. <laughs> The next regional superpower in the Middle East is clearly Iran. Iran is the principal beneficiary of America's generous destruction of its principal rival, Saddam Hussein's Iran. And I think the ambitions of Iran for regional dominance are to be underestimated at our peril. That's why it's so important that Iran not acquire nuclear weapons, because I think with nuclear weapons it would be North Korea, but North Korea poised on top of some of the biggest oil reserves in the world. One day, this very flag will fly over the parliament in London. We will see this flag that will fly over the White House, and we will see the Black House, the Kaaba, will take over the whole world. <laughs> Just imagine that those groups, Al-Qaeda for example, take over the power in any country in Saudi Arabia or trying to threaten the situation and the security in the Gulf. So I'm sure that will threaten that you know, flow of oil or export of oil to Western countries. But America cannot now withdraw from Iraq until they fix Iraq, because if Iraq is not brought to stability and to democracy, then it will be anarchy, and this anarchy would spill all over the region, and I'm not exaggerating if I say all over the world. An interruption in Middle East oil production and flow uh, would have immediate severe economic dislocation throughout the world. Uh, economy in every level will be affected. Our allies in Europe would be the first to suffer, but certainly the Asians would suffer, particularly Japan right now, and the future China as well. And we don't understand that this is a globalized economy. So you can't sit there and say, oh, you guys have got problems. We can avoid it. We can't because oil is an international market and it doesn't really matter where your oil is from but if the biggest oil center isn't producing everybody suffers I left the Middle East without an answer what are our options 
Should America stay involved and at what cost? At this time, the U.S. is losing two or three soldiers a week. But what if that number was to be 30 or 300? And what's the alternative? A world recession? I think our country could survive that. It has been done, and we emerged stronger than before. But what about the people? Is it right to police the Balkans, but leave the Middle East, just because it's more expensive? Well, I think the problem is pretty simple. For over 200 years, the people of the world, they looked up to us, the United States of America. And that meant something. We were this great hope of democracy, of freedom. And today, things are a bit different. In fact, they're the opposite. We've had a bit of an image change. People, they dislike us, they, they even hate us. Why? Because we impose our will on other countries using our military might. Why are we spending your hard-earned tax dollars to support countries like Germany, Japan, South Korea, whose economies are some of the strongest in the world. Why are you paying for their defense? They can afford militaries of their own. For over 60 years, we have opened our markets to them and provided them with free defense. Enough is enough. You know, many people in those countries live better than many Americans. If you elect me as your next president, I will take the savings from our $420 billion annual defense budget, and I will create new jobs. And together, we will build the foundation for a better, stronger America. of Asia have been over for more than 50 years. Today, Asian countries produce most of the goods we consume and old enemies are best trading partners. While the 20th century has been known as the American century, this next one will probably be an Asian one. Despite all the peace and prosperity, there is a lot of American military presence and commitments in this region. I set out to find out why. So, 더 이상 식량과 바꿔 먹을 수 있는 재산이 없었, 없었어요. 그래서 먹고 살기 위해서 탈옥하겠어요. 
처음에는 제가 <웃음> 중국으로 가겠다 했을 때 그걸 이 모든 걸 아니까 탈출을 하다 잡히면 그 정치범 수용소로 가는 거 알기 때문에 반대했었어요. 잡히게 되면 정치범 수용소라는 감옥으로 가, 가게 돼요. 그런데 이 정치범 수용소라는 감옥은 다른 일반 감옥으로 달라서 그, 어, 석방이라는 개념이 없어요. 우리 아저씨가 외국에서 편지했었는데 구나라는 별나게 본적 안돼 어떻게 내가 살아 있는 동안 온갖 향락을 다 누려야지. 야, 왜 점점 구리게 갈까? 참 한심하지. 희생된 혁명 선열들이 지금 살아 있었으면 뭐라고 했을까? 그래서 넘어올 때 만약 잡히게 되면 자살할 걸 각오하고 넘어왔죠. 저뿐만 아니라 많은 사람들이 다 그래요. 저희 어머, 그 어머니가 의사였어요. 잡히게 된몸 안에 있는 모든 그 자살할 수 있는 도구를 뺏기잖아요. 그 때문에 어머니, 어머니로부터 도구 없이 죽는 방법을 배웠어요. 그 양, 이렇게 그 머리로 올라가는 양쪽 동맥을 동시에 누르게 되면 사람이 죽게 돼요. 고통 없이 죽게 돼요. 그 방법을 배우고 나왔어요. 어머니한테는. 지금 북한에 저희 어머니와 누나들이 있어요. 그래서 만약 저희 얼굴을 북한 쪽에서 이 방송을 봐서 그 나라는 사람이 남한에 와 있다는 걸 알면 집안에 추방이 돼요. 정치범 수용소로 끌려갈 수도 있고 극심한 경우에는 정치범 수용소로 끌려갈 수 있고 경한 경우에는 감옥으로 가야, 가, 가야 돼요. 자들이 바라는 것은 미국이 북한에 대해서 그 무력으로 공격해서 김정일 정권을 제거해 주기를 학수을 해요 바래. 백성들은 저항을 안 해요. 왜냐하면 이제 북한 백성들은 다 알거든요. 김정일 정권이 나쁜 정권이라는 걸 알기 때문에 김정일 정권이 허물어지길 바라기 때문에 저항을 안 해요. The regime in North Korea is the craziest in the world. It's the least predictable in the world. It's probably the most unstable in the world. And nobody knows what's going to happen next. It could collapse tomorrow. It could go to war tomorrow. It could wipe Seoul off the face of the earth tomorrow. In that sense, there's no bigger threat to global security than North Korea. They've made numerous incursions across the demilitarized zone. They've made attempts to assassinate and been successful. in uh, killing many South Koreans at various locations around the world. He blew up half their cabinet in Rangoon in 1983. He sabotaged K-858 in 1987 with 115 South Koreans on it. He sent down assassination teams to take out the president. These are violent people. I understand that the North is still hostile but if you look at South Korea, they're twice the size in terms of population, and their economy is about 20 times larger. More than that, they benefit of the latest U.S. weapons and training, and they don't seem eager to live under the regime of the dear leader. So why couldn't they defend themselves? Like, the army, 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 the
군대를 유지하고 있고 한국 군대가 67만 명이니까 군사 그러니까 군대 인원수가 벌써 배열로 나왔고. 그래서 조선 한토의 그 군지 밸런스를 생각할 때가 서울 또이 1,200만 명이 쓴데를 맞치와 기타조선의 전선에서 와즈가 40km, 50km 정도에 쓴데 기타조선의 카호의 샤테의 하이나이 나때 히토지치이 나때. 게릴라 부대만 30만인데 북군의 절반이 게릴라 부대, 북한의 특수 부대. 이런 사람들이 일시 공격을 하게 되면 한국이 아무리 막강한 또 군사력을 가지고 있다고 해도 그게 쉽지가 않겠죠. 그러니까 서울을 그냥 밀어버리는 거는 북한이 충분히 숨은 상이 있다고 생각하거든요. 그래서 또 사실 공격을 준비하고 훈련을 하고 특수 목적의 부대에 모여들 후가 최소한 1일에 상대의 한분 이상을 파멸시킬 수 있게 되는 거예요. 미국의 화력이 빠진 상태에서 쉽지가 않을 거예요. 그러니까 그 굉장히 위험하죠. The American presence is a deterrence to North Korean adventurist action. It's worked since 53, which is roughly 52 years, so I would say that's a test that it works. If the United States were to pull out from the Northeast arena and leave the region entirely in the hands of China, Japan, and, and Korea, I foresee a great chaos. So if we are in South Korea with all the weapons and technology, why have we left such a bad regime in power for so long? The United States has removed many regimes and I can think of one that was worse than the North Korean one. But you see, besides his nuclear weapons, Kim has another ace up his sleeve. A treaty of alliance with China. In North Korea, China has a wonderful bargaining counter. It's impossible for the United States to solve the problem of North Korea without China. It's been tried and it hasn't worked. You can't really keep the Chinese out of the equation because the Chinese keep that regime teetering on the brink of collapse, but not quite collapsing. The most interesting question in the world today is what will China do with its increasing economic power? It's an extraordinarily explosive question because when one thinks back to the 1930s, in many ways World War II began with the Japanese invasion of China, not in Europe. Well, I don't think China is content as simply a regional power. China believes that it deserves to be on par with the United States. Uh, the long-term goal uh, for the Chinese leadership is to become a dominant power in the region. You know? And as a matter of fact, they said it in public that the long-term goal, strategic goal, is to eject the U.S. influence from the Asia-Pacific region. Well, China is developing the capability to launch uh, ICBMs against the United States. The same capability Russia had during the Cold War. Next five to ten years, uh, they'll have a new missile called the DF-31A, which will be able to hit anywhere in the United States with nuclear weapons. This is a new uh, phenomenon, something that the Americans don't seem to notice. Uh, I don't know why we don't pay attention to it, but it's a serious matter. Maybe containing China's rise is the real reason why the U.S. keeps all these bases in Asia. But is it realistic for us to believe that we will never have to share the world with another superpower? After all, China is reforming and the small Asian countries are in their backyard. But do these countries want to be shared? Only a hundred miles across the sea, there is an island where the other Chinese live, the ones that don't have to answer to the Beijing government. I went to see this island. The economy flourishes, people have rights and freedoms. 
This is Taiwan. At the end of World War II, there was a split in China's leadership. After a long civil war, the communist leader Mao Zedong took control of the country, while his opponent Chiang Kai-shek took refuge to this island. The United States continued to support him with weapons in the hope that one day he will retake China from the communists. He never did. After his death, Taiwan became one of Asia's thriving democracies and a prosperous country. It sounds like a great success story, however, there is a problem. China has claimed Taiwan to be part of China, even though Taiwan has been part of the Chinese rule only four years of the past century. We believe China wants to forcefully take over Taiwan, wants to incorporate Taiwan as part of their expansionary intentions. This is something that we cannot accept. We worked very hard to build democracy in this country. Many of our party leaders uh, sacrificed tremendously, spending time in prison, family members being murdered, um, people being exiled uh, to fight for the basic freedoms that we have here in Taiwan and we will not easily give that up. If China took Taiwan, it's a great opportunity. China could put military bases on Taiwan. They can absorb the military know-how. China could absorb the technology that they've developed here and use it. The most likely scenario that is being discussed at this time is something called a decapitation strike, in which Chinese special forces along with uh, pro-China elements in the military here and political elements, take the capital of Taipei first and then bring in a pro-China leader, swear him in and uh, declare Taiwan a part of China. I was invited to visit a Taiwanese naval base. The superior staff spoke perfect English and assured us of how ready they are to fight for their country. I was overwhelmed with admiration for these people and I couldn't stop thinking of how my native Romania was taken over by Soviet Union at the end of World War II and the years after. Could this be the fate of Taiwan? I also have seen three out of the four diesel submarines the Taiwanese Navy has. One of them was American made, a World War II edition. This nation is determined to fight, but is determination enough? Even with US arms, our calculation is that we cannot defend ourselves more than two weeks. The Chinese are quite capable of taking Taiwan. They're really gearing up right now for the United States military. That's what they're gearing up for. That's why they're buying all these ships and building all these planes. They're not doing it because of the Taiwan military. They can take Taiwan. We don't have any military troops in Taiwan, by the way. We don't have any military treaty. We have the Taiwan Relations Act, which in effect says that we would help Taiwan defend itself in case of attack. And I, we take it seriously. If America said tomorrow, we're not going to support Taiwan anymore, China would just take it. Uh, the thing that stops China from taking Taiwan is the United States Navy. And that's it. If the United States comes in, what happens then? Then you're looking at a potential nuclear war. That's why I think Taiwan is really the nearest thing we have to the causes of a world war today. We hope this won't happen, um, but uh, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, after all, China is a nuclear power. What the United States does about Taiwan is in many ways the big strategic decision. 
In many ways, the safest thing would be to sell Taiwan down the river, to make sure that there never is a moment when the United States has to go to full-scale war against China over Taiwan, an island that many Americans would struggle to find on a map. We hope a confrontation will never take place. Um, Taiwanese are not expecting the Americans to engage in a war for Taiwan. We're not expecting that. But we're expecting the Americans to be strong and present in this region so that a war won't have to happen. For right now, the U.S. military is still strong and present. A thousand miles across the sea is the home of the U.S. 7th Fleet, the mightiest navy in Asia. From a defeated nation at the end of World War II, Japan became a U.S. ally sometimes in the 60s. I guess that was good since Japan had no friends. At one point it brutally occupied China, the entire Korea, and many other countries. While Taiwan is so small and could never rival China with their military spending, Japan today is the world's second largest economic power. Why are we paying for their defense? When you look at the opinion poll, you would be amazed how much Japanese public trust U.S. presence here. It has been consistently above 70% support. Why do you think we have such a high support? I guess because it's provided by the U.S. taxpayers. Who wouldn't like free defense from a superpower with almost no obligation? When asked to help in Iraq, the Japanese government sent only 600 troops, and even they were not to engage in combat. I know Japan renounced militarism, but are we here because they are defenseless? Japan has got a very good navy and a very good air force using our aircraft. I believe it's the F-15. And they're good pilots and they're good seamen. They have a huge navy. and They have Aegis-class destroyers. Uh, they have some of the most advanced fighters in the world, fighter jets. So J Japan can take care of itself in many ways. Yes, they have a lot of weapons, with the exception of one. Affected by the tragedy of World War II, Japan vowed to never possess nuclear weapons and even sought the abolition of such weapons from all over the world. So what would happen should the United States leave this alliance and just bring home the 50,000 troops it currently devotes to the defense of Japan? If U.S. Uh, abruptly uh, withdraws the military presence from uh, the Japanese islands, then we'll spend the next 10 years rearming in a very serious way, uh, suddenly including acquiring nuclear capability. But if the Koreans have nuclear weapons, the Chinese already have nuclear weapons, the Russians who are in the region have nuclear weapons, the Japanese are not remaining non-nuclear. If Japanese go nuclear, do you think the Chinese can put up with that? Japanese attitude to China has turned sour and it works vice versa. Chinese public has turned sour to Japan. Japan is different from Germany. Japan did not really show any remorse of its past aggression against the Asian countries. Japan has expressed its remorse to China many times over. Our emperor and empress visited China and expressed their remorse. I don't like uh, the, the Japanese to be around. Before they really apologize to us uh, to show their sincere remorse. China replaced communism with patriotism, and Japan is a very easy target. まあ、ある程度介入で口出しをしても and the Chinese are in payback mode. 
they profoundly feel that they were on the wrong end of the 20th century and they're going to be on the right end of the 21st century. I think their long-term objective is unquestionably hegemony in East Asia and that must imply a subordination of Japan. It can't mean anything else. If the United States isn't there, Japan has to choose. Either it simply accepts subordination or it has to become a military equal uh, of China. Well, should the US leave this region, it's possible that China will accept gracefully Japan's rearmament. But what could happen if they don't? ちょっと、ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。ね。
axis of evil, nation building, or rogue states. We are just America, a nation among nations, a friend to any country that reaches out to us. However, we no longer interfere in their internal affairs. Today in the world, our citizens and businesses are respected again. No longer You have to bear in mind that the world is not naturally a peaceful, organized place. It has to be made peaceful by some kind of overarching authority. And my great fear is that if the United States opts out, maybe nobody will opt in. Americans take their freedom for granted. You take democracy for granted. You've had over 200 years of it. For us, it's really precious. And it's important that we are supported in the process of defending that. It's always pleasant to hear negotiate your way out. Do it peacefully. Uh, okay, tell that to Adolf Hitler. Tell that to Joe Stalin. Tell that to Kim, uh, Kim Il-sung. In cases, it doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. The whole planet, the civilization, I mean 6.57 billion people are, are not quite, or not everybody are quite ready to, to make decisions on their own. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's the way how it is. Americans can choose to play the role of global superpower. They can make the financial sacrifices, the military sacrifices, and actually the fundamental sacrifice of their attention to the rest of the world. They have that choice, or they can opt out. They can walk away. They did that before, when the American empire last imploded after the First World War. The results were not pretty. And my hope is that that won't be tried again, and that Americans will accept that unpopular though it may make them, wielding power is on balance preferable to running away from it.